Hey guys, so sorry this video is like two days late, but uh today I'm gonna try to catch up with the 110 play project. Um so I've been meaning to do that. It's a day that I had auditions kinda threw me off. Anyway, um let's talk about um, Satire for Three Estates by Sir David Lindsay. So he was born, uh, Sir David Lindsay was born in 490, 1490 on Scotland, died around 1555. Um, he, some things that are known about him, he attended University of St. Andrews, um, he was married in 15... 22, um, and he was an usher to James V of Scotland, um, he was later appointed Lord Lion King of Arms, and he was knighted, and he had diplomatic services, um, after James V died, he sat in in Parliament as commissioner, and um, that's about it. So his play on um, satire of three state eights is a satire of the three states and what the three states are. Basically, we have the first estate, which is the clergy, the second estate, which is the nobles, and the third estate, which is the commoners. Um. And similar to the little clay cart, um, which had caste systems, um, that's back in India, um, Britain and Scotland did have something called feudalism, which is mostly, um, in, in medieval times, but, um, the, there still was this caste system kind of deal with these states. The clergy were the highest, the nobles were the next, noble and royalty, and then, um, the commoners. And this play mainly targets the clergy. Um, it is a morality play, in a sense. It's very allegorical. Um, we don't have characters named, like, Anthony or Joseph or anything like that. Um, character names. Some of them. Well, there was a character I remember named Jenny, and there was one named Janet. Um, and there was John the Conwell. But other than that, um, we have characters like Diligence, King Community, Wantonness. Placebo, Solace, Lady Sensuality, um, Hamelessness, Danger, Good Counsel, Flattery, Falsehood, Deceit, Verity, um, Chastity, um, Poor Man, um, and I mean, did I say danger? I think I said danger. So, um, these are, this play is seen in every man. These are allegorical characters. They're not, they're, in a way you can call them stock characters. And I'll be talking about that in one character, um, section. But, um, this play in 1540 was performed at, um, when with the go palace um let me see what else that it was actually um oh and then there's Cooper bonds in fifteen fifty two um which was well, it, it was along with Cooper bands. Sorry, Cooper Vance, that's what I was friends. And, um, 
was performed alongside the Satire of Three Estates. Um, and then there's Edinburgh in 1554, so these were all classical performances, but in the 20th century, there was one performance in 1996 at the Scottish Youth Theatre's Summer Festival, and there was the Edinburgh International Festival, and there was the Edinburgh Festival in 1973, and then there was, um, a performance at the original setting with with um Lynn Lithgow Palace um that was in 2013. So this play was um written around 1540 um 80, and that was the first um public performance and the private performance, and then two years later it was the first private, I mean, public performance, and it was in Scotland. And this had, um, this place is satire. So, let's get to the plot, and I have to make a lot of notes for plot, because this play was about five hours long. So, um, as I go th through my notes, I'm just gonna try to condense it. So, Diligence introduces the play, a, um, Rex Humanitas, which is King Humanity enters and gives a soliloquy directed to God, uh, asking for his guidance and acknowledging the need to be ruled by the Council and Reason. Almost immediately, however, his intentions are undone by the entry of three um, courtiers, um, Wantonus, Placebo, and Sol Solace. And they um, persuade the king that luxury is not a sin and that uh, the king should enjoy himself. And Solace and Solace celebrate the beauty of sensuality and recommend her to the king. And she enters and is accompanied by homeliness and danger. So, again, these are all different aspects of morality and, um, things like that. So we have homeliness, danger, Solace, all that kind of stuff. And they ask the audience to behead, behold the beauty of their head, neck, blah, 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 blah. In danger invites, um, on, found and John it on stage, and all four women sing a wanton song. And then King Humanity asks Wantonness to intercede him with sensuality and scene, and scene concludes with sensuality, danger, and tameliness. Retiring with the king and the three warriors. Um, then there, there's the entrance of good counsel, and it re and it returns the world of the play to the reason diligence is opening a speech. Uh, and good counsel tells the audience that and she's powerless to act because King Humanity is under the control of sensuality. Um, this is a potential moment of reflection for the audience, with good counsel implicitly questioning the extent to which the audience itself has been, like, seduced by sensuality and her charms, and after good counsel withdraws from the, from the stage, the three vices enter flattery, um, fault at, and deceit. And all of these three figures seem to share some characteristics with Wantonness, placebo, and solace. In fact, they are very different. The vices are evil, whereas the courtiers are human flaws. Um, and the difference is reflected in the way that the play constructs the different approaches that the courtiers and vices have towards King Humanity. And they do tell uh, the king to indulge in himself, but they do so in a straightforward way. There's no real deception. All about their advice is clearly flawed and sinful and flattery, falsehood and deceit. On the other hand, plot, plot to deceive King Humanity for their own benefit. They adopt new names, devotion, sapience, and discretion in order to en enter his service and plunder him into the realm. In good counsel, tries to approach um. King Humanity, but his, is rebuffed by the vices, 
she leaves them, however, no doubt. She can see through the disguises, and the scene ends with King Community clearly under the thrall of sensuality and with devices in effect. Uh, in fact, of the control of the land. So Verity's entry adds a new urgent tone to the reforming discourse of the play. Verity is like good counsel, tries to reach King Humanity, King Humanity, but is prevented by an alliance with the vice's sensuality and various members of clergy. It's the latter who actually um accuses Verity of Percy. And the vices are particularly kind of shocked to find that Verity has her in her hand the English Bible, and the response to please Verity in the stocks. The response is to really put Verity in stocks, and although this isn't before, she's made an impassioned supplication to God to make some reasonable information. So Chastity enters and seeks shelter, and diligence suggests to her that she should had asked the priors to take her in, but as Chastity predicts, the priors rejects her. And Chastity then works her way through the clergy, the temporal lords, the merchants, before finding temporary rest among the craftsmen. And Taylor and the Satyr welcome her and offer protection. The wives, however, are kind of they're unhappy because they have no um Chalmer glue. And the tailors and the satyrs wife um chase chastity away and then beat their husbands. Finally, chastity tries to see King Humanity but falls when sensuality so tells the king that she cannot be in the same place as chastity. Interesting how huh? chastity and sensuality can't be together. And the king asks sensuality to dispose of chastity as she said in sensuality. After the vice is the place Chastity has in the stocks alongside Barry. Um, just when the case of reform seems to have completely defeated it, in corrections, a varlet enters and asks that divine corrections on the way, then prompts the vices to flee, but not when false set and, uh, and deceit steal King Humanitas' treasure box. So the entry of Divine Correction swiftly leads the um, purgation of the vices from the court. And Divine Correction's opening speech is a detailed discussion of the nature of the kingship. He asks the audience, what is a king? And gives a radical answer, um, not, not an officer. And Divine Correction is surprised that good counsel is not on good terms with King Humanity. And appeal uh, sorry not appeal appalled to see Verity and Chastity in the stocks. So he orders their release and makes his way to the court. Their courtiers uh, want in his solace and placebo to see him and although they do not know who he is, they decide that King Humanity should see him. And Divine Correction, however, does not want to be introduced and instead interrupts King Humanity's dalliances with sensuality telling that the king has slept long enough in sensuality's arms. Divine correction banishes sensuality from king, the king's presence, but she pleads successfully to be allowed to see king sh sh lodging slash altar among the, spirit the spirituality. And divine correction advises re king humanity to Call a parliament of the three states, and diligence is ordered to tell these states to attend the king. Um, so we're getting to the three states here. And then a divine correction then examines wantonness, placebo, and solace. Um, then part one ends pretty much with a concluding speech by diligence, announcing the second half that it will stage a meeting with three states. And diligence then recommends that. The audience have a drink of wine, and the ladies who um, list to pitch do so otherwise that their bladders may best burst. So, um, diligence is about to leave when he's interrupted by the pauper who enters the playing place begging for alms to feed his children. The pauper is a radical figure, I'd say, representing the effects of 
political failure and corruption upon the ordinary people of Scotland. And he tells diligence and the audience that once he was a relatively wealthy farmer, but what, then when his father, mother, and wife died on succession, he was reduced to poverty by the death duties leveled by the temporal lords and spirituality. Um, in particular, the pauper um, attacks the clergy, so which is central to this way, for reducing him to a penury and then cursing him for his failure to pay his uh, um, tip. Um, the scene ends with the pauper laying down to sleep, intelligence leading the stage, and the pauper's interruption. But yeah. So, the corrupt partner enters in the second part, um, shows off his fraudulent relics to the audience. He claims to be... Uh, he, he claims to perform instant divorces and attracts um, the interest of the henpack, Souter. And by the way, Souter actually means shoemaker, just so you know, and his wife, who um, take part in a brief obscene ceremony, and the partner's servant appears, and then they plan to spend the night. And when Wilkin leaves, Popper re enters. I'm thinking the partner's pardons might a um, get it back his cows, give him his um, last growth to that one. And when he realizes that he bought a promise of remission from the pains of purgatory once he's dead, he demands his money back, and when the person refuses, they fight over the coin. Indulgence enters and drives them off, ordering them to be both placed in prison. Actually, now thinking back, um, this, I'm talking to the camera, Mother. And thinking back, uh, sorry, this was the end of act, part one slash act one. So at this point, this is when the second part starts, and diligence enters in the three states, spirituality, which is the senior clergy, temporality, the lords and the merchant, the merchants and commoners of the town enter the parliament, walking backwards, led by their respective vices. Um, and that's the symbol of the state has fallen into disorder. When correction asks them what they why they're acting so oddly, spirituality says this is how they've always behaved, and they see nothing wrong with it. So spirituality tries to have the parliament postponed, but is commanded by the correction, by correction to remain. And diligence proclaims that anyone who is oppressed should bring their cases to parliament. John the Commonwealth enters dressed in rag clothes, and he tells a sorry story about his oppression at the hands of the noble and clergy, and points out the vices hidden, hiding among the states. Um, John's request, deceit, falsehood, and oppression are put in the stocks in covenants and um, sensuality are expelled. Good counsel comes to advise the estates on how to reform the realm. And the pauper is invited to aid John in guarding the parliament meeting. And then the parliament sets about uh, to improve the condition of the poor. And John launches a passionate attack on the men, including priests, who take the vows of poverty but live richly. So, correction enter, instructs um, merchant and temporality to um, reform themselves in the agree and make an pact with John to protect his interests in return for a pardon. And John, with the pauper's help, then commands the clergy for their. Greed, wealth, and luxury, and then the other states join in and they legislate to deprive the church of its financial privileges. And spirituality admits that he's never read the Bible and does not preach, but counterattacks by accusing John of heresy. Um, and John declares his faith but refuses to pledge allegiance to the bishops. And correction then intervenes to declare, declare John. Mm, a good Christian man. So, 
The pauper tells about how he lost all his money in the church, trying to get compensation for dead horse, being struck by numerous Latin processes which he couldn't understand, and Verity and Chastity petition the king to investigate the clergy and expel from office anyone who did not preach or teach the gospel. The scribe questions the humble Souter and Taylor and finds that they are well skilled in their trades, whereas the clergy kind of gets rich despite knowing nothing about the Bible and their responsibilities. Satire right there. Diligence is sent away to find educated clerics who can perform the role of bishops. And con theft, Andrew is looking for horses to steal. He's tricked by oppression then into swapping places with him in the stocks and oppression runs off. Um, Diligence returns with an educated um, with the educated pious priest that he found on his travels, the doctor of theology, and listened, which is scholar. Um, they enjoy, they join the parliament, correction and good counsel, tell the king to question all the clergy and expel anyone from office who's misused his position. Under questioning spirituality and his fellows reveal they have used their jobs only to live well and make money. And the, the doctor delivers this sermon telling about the two metaphorical steps on the ladder of heaven. Love God and love thy neighbor. But the clergy don't understand it. Taking this reference to ladder literally and mo they mock him. Concluding that the surgery will never reform while they have wealth and possessions, correction or orders them to be stripped of their robes. The priors reveals a scarlet ground, gown under near beneath her habit and confesses that she may only become a nun because her friends persuaded her to. She leaves to brew ale and look for a good man to marry. The friar is exposed as flattery in disguise, but he escapes punishment by or uh, offering to hang to act as a hangman to his fellow vices, um, falsehood and deceit. Um, spirituality, uh, the abbot and the vicar went and stripped or revealed as fools and flee to seek shelter with sensuality and covetous, but n since they have no money, the vices reject them. They run off then to find lodging elsewhere. For the church parched of corruption, the doctor, the doctor and the a licensed take places as the fallen bishop, and John is invited to join the parliament and given a new gown as symbol for his preservation of prosperity. Um, so then Diligence reads out the 15 reforming acts read by the three states. And finally, um, theft, falsehood, and deceit are ordered to be hanged, each making his confession before dying, naming and condemning members of the audience for sharing um, his corrupt practices. And his falsehood, falsehood dies, a black bird flies up as if it was his soul. Flattery boasts that he has escaped pun punishment. Despite the worst of the vices, he prom he leaves promising to live with a local fraudulent priest, the Hermit of Lurito. And the play basically ends with Folly coming out and making a speech. And that's that long five hour play that I read. Um very hard to and I I'm giving myself like five minutes to speak. Um a lot of characters, um, and I hope from my description you were able to, um, get a grasp. Um, diligence, humanity, wantonness, placebo, solace, sensuality, hameliness, danger, Good counsel, flattery, falsehood, deceit, verity, chastity. Um, these are all symbols. They're all allegorical characters that um, 
are important to the display. My analysis of the display, um, it's, it is difficult for a play that's five hours, like, full play cart, which I read, which, actually, really, that, that was easier to follow, um, and of course, this I will say, it's this play, not that there's anything wrong with it, but there is, it is a difficult play to follow because of its, um, Scottish roots, um, and the time period it was written in, it, it is difficult to comprehend, um, it's not as, I mean, the language is closer to English than the Greek translations of the plays, it, it doesn't have that much class language, it's, it's definitely a, a new English version, and, um, the version I read was by Ni Nigel Mays. However, still, um, there's a lot about Scottish history that, I mean, I couldn't, because I spent a day reading this play all of yesterday, and I just woke up to do this. Um, and I'm about to read two other plays. I, I can't, there's not much I can say about Scottish history, but all I know is this play does attack the clergy and the nobility and um, merchants. So all of Scotland is being attacked, um, pretty much the systems, the caste systems um, of Scotland, um, if you can call them castes. Um, and yeah, so, I apologize, this video is more of a summary, I had to, and it's okay that this play, I guess, was more of a summary, because probably no one watching this video, or not many people at all, have heard of Satire for Three States, and, when I say it's worth reading, no. Unless you like morality plays. So, um, that's just an overview for you guys. Alright, bye.